France in 1922. A young girl named Pauline was playing with her sisters by her family's farm outside of the city of Brest in Brittany, Western France. That evening, when her sisters returned home, their parents were shocked to find that Pauline wasn't accompanying them, and very quickly, it became apparent that she had disappeared. A full-scale search scoured the area for several weeks, but no trace of the young girl was ever found, until several weeks later, almost 200 miles away, in the city of Cherbourg, police found a child lost and confused in the cobbled alleyways. Her parents positively identified her as Pauline, and though there were many questions as to how she had made her way to Cherbourg, they were quickly overshadowed by her strange behaviour. Chalking it up to shock, she returned home with her parents, and all was relatively well, at least until a child's body, also identified as Pauline, showed up 800 metres from the family's farmhouse two weeks later. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Dark Histories, Season 3, Episode 14. I'm Ben, and today have I got a story for you. It's a little bit of a shorter one, but it's such a banger of a story. And I read it and I thought, I really, really have to do this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's just a great story that's just full of intrigue and mystery. And secondly, it's one of those stories where it's old and it's not English. So there was a lot of misreporting at the time. and and Basically, the misreporting has just been compounded by sort of, yeah, short blog pieces who are just phoning it in just for a quirky story or whatever, and they've done no research of their own. So all of the mistreatment of it, I guess, by the press is just kind of compounded over and over and over again. So it's like a story that I could really get into and and dig up the kind of truth of it. It's been a while since I've really sort of done that, I think. So I really wanted to get this story out. So yeah, this, this, this week is a little bit shorter, but it's a cracking story. So before we get on, I've just got a couple of announcements. Firstly, I just want to say thank you to all the new patrons, um, as always. So Wendy, Kelly, Joe, and someone whose name I'm always awful with, with names, but Liesel or Liesel, uh, Rachel, Eileen, Lindy and Sue, thank you very much and thank you to all the supporters as always. Uh, It's amazing having you on board and thoroughly humbling and absolutely helpful. Um, So thank you very, very much. And secondly, I've got a bit of an apology. Basically, if you've sent me an email in the last, say, two and a half, three months, I probably haven't read it yet because I just found out this week that my email spam filter which is set to kind of like learn what's spam and what's not has decided to learn to cut like 90 percent of any email communication sent to me from legitimate sources so um i only just found this out because i never really checked my spam filter because i thought it was set well and everything seemed to work and then just recently i thought things have been a little quiet and i had a matter that I had to check into my spam filter for. And when I checked, I just saw all of these emails that basically are from listeners that, and I obviously not seen them. So if you have sent me an email and I've not received a reply yet, I promise I will get back to you this week. Um, after this episode goes out, I'm going to spend some real time in those emails. I've scanned through them um, in, in the time I had, but I haven't sort of really read read them properly. Um, but I will do that this week. Um, I'll, I'll go through and look through and re- reply to everyone. Especially I noticed that there was at least a couple of messages in there from people who have bought Amazon books from the Dark Histories wish list and they'd sent me emails to tell me that they'd bought it and of course, naturally, I want to say thank you to you. And I, I just didn't obviously receive your email. So there's, you know, emails like this that I definitely will. There's loads of great suggestions in there for episodes, which I'm, I'm going to sort of write down all of them. And, and obviously, I'll, yeah, basically everyone, I'll get back in touch with you this week. So apologies for that. So moving on, let's get on with this episode. This week, we have Lost and Found, The Mystery of Pauline Picard. Saint Raval lies in the very western peninsula of France, nestled among the Har, the coastal region of Brittany. It is a savagely rural area, with several settlements consisting of only a single farmhouse or cottage. 
The marshes in the west of the region give way to large, tree-lined fields and beautiful rolling hills in the east, where a semblance of agriculture becomes possible. On the western coast lies the port city of Brest, with its harbour that acted as a gateway just five years prior during the First World War to thousands of US Navy men who disembarked on the shores and made their way to the trenches on the French front lines. Descriptions of the area throughout history have not been entirely kind. Writing in 1984, French poet and fiercely proud Breton Xavier Graal wrote of the area, And here is Saint-Raval with its old bluish shale houses. Nobody. The small church with its bell tower tattooed with lich and plates similar to wind roses is planted on a hillside. The field of the dead which surrounds it descends gently towards the valley to the south. In 1901, in his unfinished book of poems entitled Song of Cider, Frederick Le Gallarda wrote, Sam Raval and Beaumur, lost in the mountains, are the saddest boroughs in Brittany. A few scattered slums around a grey steeple, no trees. If not three old stunted yew trees, which are dying along the walls of the cemetery, here and there, large blocks lying in the heather, very small black weeds, aborted rye. Stony ground where hundreds of sheep graze in silence and in solitude. A whole country plunged in stupidity, frozen, dead, far from the noise, far from all rumour, for Sam Raval. Moving inland, 25 miles to the southeast of Brest, the settlement of Gao Aoludu lies hidden and peaceful. High hedgerows surround green fields and trees stand in rings atop the hills that ebb and flow throughout the landscape. There is only one farmhouse in Gao Aoludu, though the nearby villages of Pernaga and Bodingar sit within walking distance, halfway to the horizon. In 1922, the farmhouse was owned by the Picard family, Francois Picard, a farmer, and his wife and nine children. Life on the farm was not particularly easy. Wolves threaten the livestock. The agriculture is sparse and hard going, and the landscape can be unforgiving in difficult weather. The Picard's farm is modest, though they keep some livestock as well as horses, and the children worked alongside their parents to ensure the hole ran smoothly. On 6th of April, 1922, Pauline Picard, the eighth youngest child at just two years old, was seen out playing with her sisters in the farmhouse yard, and at around 4.20pm, her father watched as she went off with her older sisters to tend to the horses in the nearby hills. When the children returned later that evening, They were without Pauline, and panicked, the parents sent for the local gendarme to arrange for a search. The weather had turned as the sun had dropped, and a storm was blowing in from the coast, turning the sky bruised, swollen and angry. The next day, a search party was sent out to look for Pauline, consisting of over 150 local volunteers, the local parishioner and police, as well as trained hunting dogs, and yet nothing was found of the young girl. Police turned their attentions to suspects, and right at the top was a 50-year-old man named Monsieur Caramon. Caramon was a slight man who walked with a limp, heavily mustachioed. He had been known to the Picards for a time, and had spent the day of the 5th working on the farm. Several months previous, he had been released from prison, where he had served time for violent crime. He had, witnesses said, showed an interest in Pauline, offering her sweets and talking with her during his workday. Now, however, he was nowhere to be found in the local area, though the police maintained their search while simultaneously conducting the volunteers in their hunt for the young child. Fears rippled through the volunteers, and as they kicked back hedgerows and paced through fields, they began to whisper that Pauline had fallen foul of the difficult weather from the night before, or worse, to wild boar. Boar had been known to thrive throughout the area, and with grim faces, Theories began leaning towards the girl having been eaten, as no trace was found. In a fantastic display of prejudice that existed in the area during the early half of the 20th century, many thought to blame it on gypsies, despite the fact that the paper reported that none had been observed in the neighbourhood at the time of the disappearance. On the 9th of April, police managed to track down Keramon though the result only managed to clear up the possibility of their only known suspect of having played any role in the disappearance. He told police that he'd been working over four miles away at the time of the abduction, and when police followed up his claims, they found it checked out. 
with no other leads and no trace of Pauline turning up from the ongoing search party's efforts, things were fast running into a dead end for all involved. Over a month later, in early May, hope in the Picard household was at an all-time low and acceptance had begun to take hold. A visit from the gendarme, however, sparked a new enthusiasm. It was thought that Pauline had been spotted in the city of Cherbourg, almost 200 miles away by road, or 120 miles straight through the difficult-to-navigate fields. The child was picked up as she had been walking aimlessly through the back alleyways of the streets and taken to a local convent home for orphan children. The gendarme presented a photo of the young girl, and though she looked thinner, both parents agreed that she bore a heavy resemblance to their missing daughter. The next day, on the 8th, they travelled with the police to Cherbourg with a new hope to see the girl with their own eyes. Upon meeting her, neither father nor mother were convinced that she was their daughter. She was much thinner, though police assured them this could have been due to weight loss. After all, no one was really sure what the girl had been doing for the previous month. She appeared well looked after, and her clothing, though different from the clothing that she had been wearing when she left the farm, was in relatively good condition. More strange was her behaviour to the Picards. When they were introduced, the girl remained mute, as she had been since the police had found her, and she showed no signs of emotion or happiness to see her parents again. In fact, As the parents spoke to her, asking her questions, it seemed to become apparent that she didn't speak Breton at all, an isolated, Celtic language spoken by all the population of Brittany, including the Picards. This was chalked up to her mute state, however, as the paper later reported. She seemed to understand no language and could only make sounds incomprehensible to anyone. As her parents spent time with her, however, her father slowly began to warm up to the fact that this peculiar young girl was in fact Pauline. The mother was less sure, but after speaking with the local justice, who theorised Chock may have caused amnesia, she agreed to stay for a second day to see how the child reacted to their presence. By the next day, the mother too was coming round, stating that the girl had similar shaped ears as Pauline, whilst the father was, by now, absolutely adamant the girl was Pauline. He pointed to the colour of her eyes, saying that he would recognise them anywhere. Satisfied, the justice released the girl, allowing her to return to the Picard farm and hoped that after she spent some time there, her memories should fully return. The gendarme who escorted the family home on the train that afternoon observed that the girl had begun to speak Breton. Specifically, she spoke the words Dad, Yes and No. When the Picards returned home on the 11th of May, they reintroduced Pauline to her brothers and sisters. Slowly, the local populace, after having searched for so long, filtered past the house, stopping in to see the child safe and sound. All, including the brothers and sisters, told of how happy they were to see Pauline home and seemed to recognise the child, wishing her well in the recovery of her memories as they left. For the girl's part, she quickly fell in step with her brothers and sisters, playing alongside them happily. The doctor visited, also confirming her identification, and told the parents that though she was weak and had lost a lot of weight, she bore no signs of mistreatment and would soon return to full health. Over the next days, she settled in and the parents became convinced that Pauline had indeed returned safe and sound. How she had gotten to Cherbourg was a question that slowly fell into the background, as the child called the house cat by its pet's name, and appeared to recognise people and places around her. And so things carried on for the next several weeks. Pauline began to return to health, and slowly, her Breton language ability began to return, and so assumed her parents must have memories. Peace began to return to the farm, except for two rather curious incidents that occurred over the following weeks. First came the visit of a neighbour named Yves Matin, Matan asked to see Pauline, and assuming he was there to share in the happiness that the girl had returned safely, Madame Picard called for Pauline to come and greet Matin. As she strode into the kitchen, however, he leapt back, screaming wildly and shouting, God help me, I am guilty, as he ran from the house, out into the winding pathways towards the neighbouring villages. Strange as this incident appeared to the Picards, it was nothing to what was to happen next. 
On the morning of the 26th of May, Monsieur Lemieux, a neighbouring farmer, was cycling through the fields on his way to collect his herd of cows when, from the corner of his eye, he noticed clothing strewn about in a field, just 800 metres from the Picard farm. As he approached the mess, he saw that it was not only clothing lying in the fields, there was also a badly injured body of a young child. Its head was missing along with several limbs and while some of the clothing lay scattered across the area, there was a small bundle in a neat folded stack next to the body. He rushed to alert the Picards and as the local population awaited the gendarme, who was not able to arrive until the next day, they organised shifts to watch over the site to ensure wild animals were kept at bay. When the authorities arrived the following morning, and after a formal inspection of the area was carried out, they discovered a skull, clean of flesh, lying two metres from the headless body, along with remnants of clothing and hair in a nearby bush. The clothing folded up next to the almost naked body was badly damaged and covered in blood, but neatly folded. During a post-mortem, several cuts were found on the body, which were suspected to be knife wounds, including an incision below the rib cage and in the groin. An inquiry was immediately held, and questions as to the identification of the body were immediately raised. The Picard family had already visited the site and seen the body of the girl, and through the clothing and the hair in the bushes, they had identified the body to be that of Pauline, their young daughter who had gone missing over six weeks prior. This, of course, raised several new questions. Foremost being that if the body was indeed Pauline, then who was the girl now living with them in their care, who they had found in Cherbourg? The English-speaking press picked up the story and were happy to chime in on what they were calling the Breton mystery. Although it would seem almost incredible that the parents should make a mistake, the Picards are now uncertain whether the child they have been nursing for more than a month is really their own, and the police are faced by a threefold task. To discover the murderer, identify the murdered child, and if she is proved to be Pauline Picard, to discover the identity of the little girl from Cherbourg. At least one of the three questions could be easily answered. At the inquiry, it was concluded that the body of the young girl was satisfactorily identified as Pauline, which, despite the problems that this turned up, was the least perplexing of their findings to many people. They also, rather strangely, concluded that the cause of death had been accidental, theorising that the little girl had gone out with her sisters on the day of her disappearance, got lost, alone and in a panic, wound up stuck outside in the storm that tore through the vicinity that night, eventually leading to the girl being stranded and starving to death. The wounds on the body, meanwhile, were attributed to animals scavenging. Naturally, this conclusion was almost universally discarded by the locals and those that had been involved in the search parties in the days following Pauline's disappearance. For starters, how would the young girl have been lost so close to her home, in an area that was not difficult to walk freely through? If she had died in the field of natural causes, an even stronger argument put forward by the locals was the small matter of how they would have overlooked the site during their searches, which were conducted by over a hundred people and included trained tracking hounds. During the inquiry, the coroner brushed the voices of the locals aside, stating that they must have been mistaken and just thought they had searched the area, whilst they had not. This was, without even questioning how the body could have been in the field for several weeks unnoticed, even by simple passers-by. The local parishioner who had helped to organise the searches stated adamantly that the searches were so thorough that we would have found a wallet if it was lost. We found no body. There were questions as to the quality of the post-mortem which had been carried out in a local barn by torchlight and without sufficient tools available. The French papers pointed to the fact that if scavengers had decimated the body such as the girl's stomach and soft tissue areas left intact areas which by normal standards, would have seen the first signs of scavenging. The stomach of the girl, along with several other organs, were eventually sent off to a university hospital for investigation, but they returned no conclusive information. As if the picture needed any more muddling, the skull found next to the body was found to be that of a full-grown male and was far too big to be that of a two-year-old child. If this was the case, where was the young girl's head? 
and what of the clothes which had been reported on by several witnesses as having been folded and placed next to the body. As for the identity of the young girl from Cherbourg, several backtracking statements were made almost immediately. The father, Francois Picard, was now stating that the girl in their care was perhaps younger than Pauline, whilst the papers began pointing out that the girl appeared like a city girl rather than the strong children of the Picards, who all had strong noses. One paper also printed rumours that the Picard parents had had little to do with Pauline's upbringing and that the other children had raised her almost exclusively. Perhaps, they thought, the parents made mistakes on the identification simply because they were not altogether sure what Pauline really looked like. Others still commented on her lack of Breton language understanding and now called what they were reporting only days prior as speech as babbling. One of the largest swings came from the printing of information in the press that the young Cherbourg girl was 60 centimetres tall, whilst Pauline had been 77 centimetres tall. In regards to leads on who might be now considered a suspect, police had only one. The story of the manic neighbour, Monsieur Le Mieux, was retold to police and of how he had screamed, God help me, I am guilty, before running from the Picard's kitchen after seeing Pauline alive and well. Efforts were made to track down his whereabouts, only to find that he had been judged insane and sent off to an asylum shortly after the situation with Pauline. Whilst many thought this perhaps bolstered the suspicion against him, the press were quick to point out that he had in fact been judged to be simple for a long time before the event, due to an accident that he had had whilst at work that had left him mentally handicapped. With nothing left doing in regards to the identity of the body, she was buried in the cemetery under a headstone engraved with the name of Pauline Picard. The Picard family attended the funeral and then escorted the young girl that they had taken in from Cherbourg back to the convent where she was left in hopes of finding her true home. This was a task that never came to be, as one year later she died in the convent after suffering from measles. After the event, there were several strange rumours that began to arise from the whispers in the fields and across the farmlands of Brittany. Concerning the child in Cherbourg, many began to wonder if she had been a child abandoned by a foreigner, possibly an American, which might have led to her being mute, as she would have not only not understood Breton, but French too. Furthermore, perhaps this was why the press interpreted her speech, which would have been English, as simply babbles. As for the identity of the body in the field and the murderer of Pauline, two stories arose in tandem. The first was that the murderer had been Francois Picard, the father. In Le Journal Lue Claire, they printed a piece that, whilst giving no names, heavily insinuated the father as having been prone to violent outbursts, and it pointed to the parents pretending that Pauline had been theirs all along, especially pointing their finger once again at the father He was the first to conclude the girl was Pauline when they had gone to Cherbourg. A second rumour, perhaps more spectacular than the first, was the story that made the quiet rounds in the locals. This told of a rich family who had recently lost a daughter and needed to find a replacement in order for the child's death to remain hidden, as they feared the story getting out to the press might jeopardise their standing in society, along with a large inheritance that they were due. Proponents of the rumour stated that the Picards had sold Pauline to this wealthy family and the headless body of the girl was that of their dead daughter planted to cover the whole thing up. Eventually, we are left with little but speculation and wild rumour. No trace of Monsieur Lemieux was ever found and the case closed with the official line that the death had been accidental, caused by starvation. One curious final report came later in July when the girl now back in a convent, reportedly began to speak Breton very clearly and knew the names of the other Picard children and concludes, It is now suggested that the baby who seemed destined to go through the world nameless and unowned may be the real Picard child. Though it appears the report fell on deaf ears as the child remained in the convent home until her death several months later. Although the story of Pauline Picard sounds fantastic and almost unbelievable, especially on the part of the Picard parents, 
It's not a case in isolation. Ten years prior to the case of Pauline Picard in the United States, the case of Bobby Dunbar had been equally as baffling to many when a young couple from Louisiana reported their son missing after he had walked off during a family fishing trip. He was found and returned months later after being found in Mississippi, and though the case was prolonged and went through quite a long, drawn-out court case, Bobby Dunbar eventually went on to live with the Dunbars for his entire life until he passed away in 1966. In 2004, a DNA test was eventually run on his remains by relatives in order to clear up the story once and for all, only for the results to show that Bobby Dunbar was in fact not Bobby Dunbar at all and bore no blood relation to the Dunbar family. The Bobby Dunbar case is really an entire episode in itself, but I've introduced it here to illustrate a certain point. Was the misidentification of Pauline Picard accidental, as the parents claim, and could they really not have recognised their own daughter? Or was it intentional, as so many of the rumours spawned after the fact claimed? Or was it, perhaps, a period of grief and denial that pushed the parents into wanting to believe the child to be their own so much so that they simply believed it into reality? This latter theory holds a fair amount of traction. However, it does not explain how those in the surrounding community were also fooled into thinking Pauline had returned. Or were they just playing along, some perhaps unsure, whilst others too embarrassed or shocked to point out that the child appeared to have shrunk by 17 centimetres in her time away from the farm. In the end, it is all a matter for conjecture, as none of the stories are able to be cleared up with so much time passing. We are left with the same questions put to the police by the English press, all unanswered in any satisfactory way. Who killed Pauline Picard? Who was the child from Cherbourg? And who was the body, if not Pauline? Even if the body really was Pauline, there is still one last mystery. Whose skull was lying next to the body, and why had it been switched with the head of the young girl in the first place? So the story of Pauline Picard is a pretty crazy one, right? Like I say, it was really short this week compared to you know how dark histories actually it was actually about the same length as the old dark histories episodes when i started but um you know gradually over time i've I've taken on bigger things and uh written much longer episodes but um yeah i just thought i really like this story I, i find it really compelling and perhaps quality over quantity let's get this good a good story out it's not a super well known story either so i really wanted to get it out so yeah We're going to kind of address some of these questions, right? As always, after this horrible little piece of capitalism. Thanks for listening to Dark Histories. This podcast is entirely independent and funded by myself and listener support. So in order to do that, we need to, you know, run a few ads. So by that end, we've become an official affiliate with Audible. If you're unaware of what Audible is, it's an audiobook subscription service where you pay a monthly fee and with that fee you get a credit that you can spend on an audiobook of your choice. It's actually quite a good service and I'm a member of it myself so I'm quite happy to have it as a kind of advert in Dark Histories despite the fact I don't really like adverts because I just think it's a, a good service that's a decent value for money. The basic deal with Audible is that you get a credit once a month that you can spend on an audiobook and if you cancel, you keep all your books, which is quite nice. They don't take any of your stuff away. Um, you, I, I routinely start and stop my subscription when I, when I don't need to use it, basically. And all my books stay there. They have an app on iOS and Android and I do believe Windows as well. So you can always listen to it on any device. And they all sync up as well, which is pretty handy. If this sounds at all interesting to you and you're interested in trying it out then head over to audible.com forward slash dark histories and you can get a one month trial where you get a free audiobook of your choice. At the end of the trial, if you don't like it or you think it's not ready for you, you can cancel it and it'll, you can keep your free audiobook. And by using our affiliate link, we get a small kickback in the process which helps to support the show. So it's win-win for everyone really. So if you are interested, that link again is audible.com forward slash dark histories. 
Or if you prefer, go to darkhistories.com, check out support, and you'll find a link there that leads directly to the trial page. Thanks very much. Ads are a pain in the butt, right? Of course, you can hit that 30 second skip button, and that's all cool. But a much cooler way of skipping the ads is to sign up to the Dark Histories Patreon. You get a bunch of different benefits for doing so, including ad free shows, access to early release episodes, the full back catalogue of bonus episodes, including the live stream archive, and all the other bonus content. You get access to all my research notes for each episode, and you get the added bonus that you're actually a part of the show helping to keep it independent and sustainable from as little as $1 a month. So if you think that might be something you might be interested in doing, hop over to darkhistories.com and you'll find the support page with all the details to get involved. Thanks very much for not skipping this and giving my hard sell a listen. Let's get back to the show. Welcome back. Thanks very much for sticking around. So really the questions are pretty much like I sort of ended it there. And it's interesting how they were kind of asked at the time and they've just basically never never been answered. And one of the most frustrating things with this case, like most historical cases where things are, are sort of so gone now, and especially when they're from rural areas like this where they're not particularly well sort of represented in the press or by even authorities, so there's no real records kept or anything like that you just end up with just almost all of it just lost to time. In many respects, it's actually quite fun because it means we're really essentially and completely free to speculate because every theory is more or less as strong as the next. But on the flip side of that, the speculation might be fun, but it, we know that it will never lead anywhere because we'll never have the answers that we're searching for. So I suppose the first question we're left with is, is really who's the child from Cherbourg? Let's let's go with that one first. So who who was the child from Cherbourg? Was it Pauline or was it not Pauline? I'm pretty convinced that it it clearly wasn't Pauline. I don't her her ability to speak Breton even in the final um, press report from England um, in July. Actually, it was an American paper, not an English paper. It was an American paper in July that said that. Perhaps she really was Pauline after all, and she could now speak Breton. To me, I, I don't think that's the case. The paper actually misreported a few things. It said that the girl had only spent a few days in the care of the parents in Brittany, and she was now able to speak Breton. But she wasn't. She basically, she, she knew her brothers and sisters' names, and that was about it, really. Um, I think she could say the word bread. I think. And she'd been there for much longer than a few days. She'd been there for like several weeks. So she probably would have picked those things up anyway. So I don't think that that last report really has anything to it. I think perhaps they were kind of fishing for a story that wasn't going anywhere there. To, to me, it's the height discrepancy, which comes out later. It seems like the press are almost um, sort of treading lightly at first. And then once the parents identify their body as Pauline they kind of let loose with what they were really sort of insinuating for a while which was that it wasn't Pauline and they kind of really let loose with a lot of their kind of information one piece of that information is that she was not anywhere near as tall as Pauline so I, that I found that to be probably the most compelling piece of evidence that she she wasn't Pauline because I mean the fact that she couldn't speak Breton and stuff that that's weird, but you know you that that stuff that you could possibly potentially put down to shock of a trauma or something like that. You know, it's it's totally not unheard of for people to have really big personality changes or sort of changes in things like the language or even accent that they speak. I've I've seen that before. I can't remember what that's called, but people wake up with different accents after. I'm not sure if it's always a trauma, but. They, they they start speaking in a completely different accent um, and sometimes, you know, a completely different language um, and things like that. Could have had amnesia. She could have had a massive personality change from, due to shock or whatever. So I, I don't think any of that stuff is particularly compelling evidence that says that it's not Pauline, but the height thing's really the kind of final nail in the coffin there, right? I mean, you that's not something that can change. You can't just drop 17 centimetres 
electro shock. So I, I, I'm fairly sure that say the the little girl in Sherbrooke was probably not Pauline. But if she wasn't Pauline, then what about her parents? And and what about her? Because one thing that I felt was interesting was you could say that she was abandoned or something like that. But the doctor said that she knew she wasn't really mistreated and she had decent clothes on. In fact, they sort of insinuated that she had, again, this is difficult because it's it's insinuation and it's insinuation in, in a language that I'm not overly familiar with. So I, I'm, I was kind of, it's, it's a struggle for me here, but to me, it seemed that they were insinuating that they were clothes that were too expensive for the Picards to have afforded. If you like, they sort of said things like that she was, a, she, like I think um, one of it was that she was appeared like a city girl, whereas, you know, the Picards were kind of strong. Um, and it, it, it's all kind of insinuation, I think, that, yeah, that, that, she, that, that, that Pauline was probably a little bit more, um, rather, sorry, the girl from Cherbourg was a little bit more kind of prim than the roughness or gruffness of, of the Picard children. So, she, yeah, she seemed to be quite well looked after anyway, is the point. So I wonder, would she have been, you know, it doesn't really lend itself to someone who would be abandoned. But the the theory at the time seemed to be that she was abandoned by a foreign, like a, a foreign couple or foreign parentage, and they just left her in France and just sort of gone off home. I don't think there was any evidence for that. But it is quite, I, I actually think that's not a bad story because she, like I say, like people said that she just babbled and was incoherent and mute and she didn't seem to understand anyone. So I think I can, you know, I can see that, you know, she could have been perhaps completely foreign. So not only could she not speak Breton, she couldn't speak French. So she would have been totally lost no matter where she was. And then that would kind of lend her to being mute and babbling, as the paper so politely called it. So... Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think that fifth theory is quite solid, that she was perhaps kind of abandoned by a foreign family. It's all pretty sad, really. But that's kind of what I think is perhaps the Sherbrooke child. I think that she was perhaps a foreign, foreign-born and didn't speak French or, or Breton at all. Um, and I definitely don't think it was Pauline. So then we get to if the body was Pauline, which I think it probably was. I think the body that they found probably was Pauline. I don't really believe that 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 rumour that was going around that a rich family bought Pauline to cover for their daughter and that's why the head was missing because they chopped the head off to disguise the identity of their dead daughter. I mean, it, to me, it all just seems like that's the sort of story that is going to be cooked up by the underclasses against, you know, a kind of dirty scandal against the kind of upper classes. To me, that that seems about right. A lot of kind of that sort of scandal could easily be accepted and, and sort of sperm forward and seems kind of juicy rumour kind of thing. And it, I, I can see that story kind of growing quite quickly out of the situation. And I actually agree that it was possibly scavenged to some extent, but I don't agree with the conclusion of the inquest at all. So firstly, I, I think I find it strange that I find it implausible, in fact, that she could have been there for a month and no one found her. Um, so that's for start. So I definitely think she was dumped at a later date. The difficult thing comes with the clothes that were folded because there are so many inconsistencies with the reporting, but there are certainly, it's, it's explicitly pointed out that witnesses said that the clothes were folded, but the body was first found by the clothes being scattered around. So that's difficult. In the only way it kind of reconciles itself there is by saying that some of the clothes were folded and some of them were scattered. Well, that seems quite strange, unless they were folded and became scattered after the scavenging. If she'd only been left out one evening, perhaps if she was left out the night before, perhaps she was dumped, and that there was some scavenging that night. But you know, I think perhaps that scavenging could have taken off a lot of things. You know, like could have gone off with the head. I mean, some of her hair was found in a bush a metre and a half away. So, you know, something could have dragged her head through a bush um, and scarpered with it. They never found it. But yeah, I mean, that that's plausible to me. Along with some of her limbs as well, because some of her limbs were missing. Again, the, if the body was 
that much decomposed. It's a bit grim, but you know they, they could have been dragged off by animals. I don't think that's totally un sort of. I don't think that's too crazy, and I think that also would, you know, if she was dumped the night before, perhaps that's why none of her soft tissue was eaten because they just didn't have the time to do that. You know, perhaps they only had the time to kind of drag away bits and pieces, as, as gross as that sounds. Um, but then the strange thing is, what was the skull doing there? Unless the skull was dumped at the same time, and it wasn't, you know, because it only the skull only really become a thing because the girl had no head. And if the head had been dragged away by an animal, suddenly that skull becomes like a huge deal. But if the girl had had a head and the skull was there, the skull would become not necessarily less of a deal, but slightly sort of less important to the story of Pauline, at least. So, you know, that, that, that's quite interesting. I, 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 I don't know what to think there. I do think it was possibly animals, but I definitely think she was dumped and I, I definitely think she was murdered. I don't think she was, you know, I don't think she got lost in a storm and starved to death 800 metres away from her house. <laughs> Although she was only two years old, that's not old and, and that seems quite crazy, but she seems to have been quite mobile. And although she was often about with her brothers and sisters, you know, it doesn't seem unusual that she was out sort of walking through the hills with her brothers and sisters to look after horses and livestock and such. So I don't think she would have got lost 800 metres from her house, um, even in a storm. And if she did, I don't think she would have starved to death in one night. Or, you know, if she... She would have had to start to death for a prolonged period. I think she could have eventually wound up walking home or walking onto a pathway that she recognised or just bumping into somebody if she was that close to the farm. I don't, I don't, I can't see how that would work. And I do believe that the area was searched as well. The search party seemed pretty serious. So to think that they could have overlooked it, I think is nonsense. I definitely think she was definitely murdered. Who by though? I mean, that's a different story. I don't really think it was the dad. I think the mum and dad were actually quite innocent. I don't think they intentionally took the child. I think perhaps it was that kind of deep grief um, that kind of led them to taking the child, almost like a kind of denial. I don't, I don't think it was the father, say, it's not, not for any reason, really, because there's not enough on them to really solidly judge it, to be honest. But it just seems it doesn't really fit to me. Why, why would the father do it and then kind of, dump the body a month later i don't i don't know it seems strange but then i don't think it was Le, monsieur lemur either um although that was quite strange about him running out of the house when he saw pauline but i don't i don't know it could have been him i suppose but otherwise i mean it, it does seem that this place was really rural and it could have been any passerby yeah you know, any wanderer anyone passing through i think the murderer was always going to be impossible to find almost in this case because it's just so rural, like such a rural area that I think anyone passing through could have done a crime like this and just gotten away with it. Although if they were passing through, then how would the body have turned up a month later, I suppose? They say it was likely to have been a local. So, And so I suppose the last question really is the skull that was lying next to the body you know, was it there as a decoy? I don't, I don't actually think it was because I don't think it would have been very convincing as a decoy because the skull was entirely stripped of flesh, whereas the body, they still spoke of it having, as having soft tissue. So why would the skull have been stripped of flesh? I actually think that it, that it, was, would it, that it is more a case of the fact that her head was perhaps dragged away gross as that sounds and the skull became because of that fact more important than it was like i sort of said i, I should think that perhaps whoever dumped the body dumped the skull at the same time and it became sort of involved in pooling because it was originally mistaken for her head which obviously being a skull leads it more to being a murderer as well so i guess the murderer had killed at least two people although where's the rest of the body of the that came from the skull, I guess. It's, yeah, it's a peculiar case um, and one that I really, really wanted to do for Dark History. So, like I say, it was shorter this week. But I hope you enjoyed it. There's loads to think and talk about, I guess, and loads to speculate, which is a lot of fun. Um, and just, just a great mystery that's kind of mired in, I guess, the past now and we never find out. So if you want to come along and chuck in some speculation, this is definitely going to be something we're going to be talking about at next week's live stream. 
I'm going to try and swing it a little bit earlier than normal so it fits more for European time because I think the last three or four have all been American sort of time zones. So I'll, st- I'll try and do this one a little bit earlier. Um, I'll try and fit it so it's kind of acceptable for as many people as possible. Um, but yeah, it'll be earlier in the evening. Um, so hopefully Europeans can make it along if they want. Um, the live streams have been really great recently. They're total carnage. There's not really much structure. We sort of start talking about the subject and, and we slowly kind of go off topic. And But we end up generally talking about other interesting things. And it's always kind of weird mystery talk or spooky talk or, you know, um, time slips. I think we got right off on one about that. And I think last week we ended up talking for quite a long time about the viability of disposing of bodies via pigs. Um, So, yeah, if you want to come along, say it's a free-for-all. Anyone can join in the chat. You can either type on YouTube or you can actually jump into the onto the live stream with us and and talk. And it's say it's a total free-for-all. Everyone's welcome. There's no structure. There's no real kind of like... um, gate of entry you just need to basically a pair of headphones with a microphone on um will do the job i'll post about that in the coming days and that'll go up out on all our social media and that if you want to follow our social media we're on facebook at facebook.com forward slash dark issues podcast we're on twitter at dark histories all one word and we're on instagram at dark underscore histories and if you want links to any of that stuff, it all can be found on darkhistories.com, which you'll also be able to find a place to contact me, and I'll be able to read the email now. Um, and you'll also be able to find ways that you can support the podcast, which would be amazing if you can. Uh, if you can't, don't worry. But if you could leave a review, that would be great, because we're getting loads of reviews now. I'm going to try and kind of... I'm not going to beg too much, but, you know, um, if we can keep getting the reviews, that would be amazing if we can keep them rolling in. They've really helped, and it just helps the show get discovered. The more the show gets discovered, the more listeners. The more listeners, the more viable it gets. So, yeah, thanks very much for listening. Thanks very much for all your support um, and everything you do, sharing, reviewing, supporting, or just listening and enjoying. Thank you very much. I, I genuinely appreciate it. So it's always a pleasure to share these stories. I'll see you all either two weeks for another episode, or if you do want to come along to the live stream, I'll see you all next week for the live stream. So until then, have a great week. Take care. Sleep tight.